Hi, welcome to Leaving the Lies and Speaking Your Truth. Um, first of all, I'm going to uh, introduce my co-host, uh, Autumn. Thank you so much for being with us today, Autumn. Um, how are you doing? Hey. I'm good. How are you, Mel? Very good. Um, we have a special guest today. Um, Gary, Gary Stone is our guest today. Gary was a kid when we knew him in the house of Yahweh. Um, we knew Gary because he was the younger brother of one of our very good friends and, um, who at the, is actually still in the house of Yahweh at this time. Um, Gary, I remember Gary being, Gary was always a really cute kid. Come on. He was adorable. He was. Always had a big smile on his face. <laughs> Gary, thank you so much for reaching out to us about doing this interview. How are you doing today? I'm good. Awesome. Let me just say this, though, Mel. Let me interrupt for a moment. You do that. He was a cute kid, but he's a very handsome man. Hey, now. truth. <laughs> yes. Truth. <laughs> okay. All right. Gray's starting to creep in already, but, you know. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, is that it's weird for us because you know how time kind of, when you don't mm. see somebody for a long time, you still picture them the way they were the last time you saw them. We still think of you as being that kid, even though you're a man now. <laughs> <laughs> that lanky my tall kid, kid. My yeah kid, same age as you remember me being <laughs> yes <laughs> incredible <laughs> hey gary uh -oh. how old were you when you came to the house of yahweh i was i think our first feast was passover of 89 um so i would have been nine um my first feast we went it was just me and my mom and dad um my two older sisters um, they had their prom and at that time they were already preaching that there was no point in going to school. There was no point in getting an education because there was going to be no future. So my sisters wanted to have the prom that they thought was going to be the only prom they'd ever get to go to. And so my, mom, my parents let them stay at home, um, while we went to Texas to go to the feast. So it was just me, my mom and dad, that first feast. Um, well, that was our, that was our first feast too. Wasn't that your first feast, Autumn? Uh, mine was Tabernacles. Oh, okay. Mine you was Passover of 89, Passover. too. Passover. Mine yeah, I, and I don't remember that probably because your sisters weren't there and I was more their age than your age. So I, I right. that's, uh, but that's interesting. It was the same, same feast was my first feast. So um, did you want to join the house of Yahweh or uh, basically were you, or did you really believe in it or were you just going because your parents brought you? Um... To begin with, I didn't have, I, I, obviously, I didn't really have any say in the matter. Um, I had right. to, with it, but um, I actually got baptized that first feast at nine years old. Like, I was all about it. Um, wow. And I don't know if it was the fact of that I necessarily believed everything that I was being told, or I just wanted to kind of fit in, and I made a bunch of new friends, and, um, right. you know, it, I, I don't want to say I was pressured into it, but my father kind of, you know, led me to that decision um yeah and it's hard to say at that age you know really in hindsight what you would really be aware of what you were committing to or what you were really doing that's understandable yeah um <clears throat> excuse me promise i don't have coronavirus i just got choked up <laughs> um you were a part of the runners that ran errands and or messages for yeshua hawkins offices during the feast I know that you also were, I think, a personal messenger for Yedidia and the outer office, if I remember correctly. Um, what was that experience like? What what were exactly your duties and what took place? Um, I guess I started it, um, you know, pretty young. I guess when I was 10 or 11, I, I, I joined the runners and um, that's basically it. I would run mayor errand uh, errands or messages for Yadidia or Yisrael or, or Buffalo Bob, whatever he wants to call himself. Um, I, uh, it's hard to remember, um, <laughs> you know, specifics about what I did, but I, uh, I ran errands and messages. And, um, like you said before, I, I, I wasn't always aware of what the, you know, I always kind of knew things before other people did, so it kind of could be a burden at times. But, um, and then as I got a little bit older, I uh, kind of transitioned more into, like, the guards, like the PAs. Um, 
but you had to be of a certain age. You had to be 20, I think, to be a, a, a PA, a personal aid, to, mm. which is his, like, goon squad, basically. Um, so, but I wasn't old enough to, to, to be an actual PA, um, but I did work with them a lot as far as um, I just had unique training um, as far as, like, hand-to-hand combat and that kind of thing. So I did a lot of, like, training with, with the personal aides um, uh, on that kind of stuff. Um, I would go. Would you, say that the, would you say that the PAs were kind of like Yeshro's secret service? Oh, most definitely. Yeah, yeah, they were his goon squad for sure. Uh, they were n- not a one of them would strike fear in anyone's heart. <laughs> but, um, but yes, they were. They tried to be tough. So, so Gary, is the reason that you never actually became part of that group was because you left before you were able to, before you came of the yeah. age to do that? Okay. Yes. Um, I did. I was part of like the guard there when I was like, once I was 16 or 17, I think they made an exception. And um, so they would let me go to, you know, when we would have the feast out in, um, in Eula in Clyde at the, at the 44 out there we would still have to do like guard duty at the press room overnight in, in town in Abilene in there. Yeah. Um, so I did that. Um, every feast I would, once or twice I would go, um, like pull an all night shift at the, at the old press room, uh, at the old sanctuary, the press room. Okay. Um, I was really creepy too. That place was really creepy at night. <laughs> that sounds, that sounds, especially for a, a teenager, a kid, that would not be a fun job. <laughs> um, so, real, I'm sorry, Mel. Oh, go I'm ahead, sorry. hon. I go just ahead. I thought of something. I have to ask. Mm-hmm. Um, Yishro would come over to my parents' house for a meal during mm-hmm. the feast. Um, mm-hmm. I remember you actually showing up and somebody else showing up in a black suit um, and standing at the front door, and you didn't take any food or anything. Was that just something maybe you just did or I don't recall what, um but I imagine it was just because I was assigned that was I was on duty or something um okay. I don't, yeah I don't really remember that okay. no. well the only reason why I remember is because you know your your sister being you know my best friend and she basically lived with us during the feast right I remember thinking why won't he take my food <laughs> yeah. Is that a rule? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I don't, maybe I just wasn't hungry. <laughs> okay. It could have I'll been something it. real simple. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, so, Gary, I know that your dad, um, I don't know, I don't remember exactly when he became ordained an elder, but I know he was ordained an elder fairly shortly after you guys joined. Did that put any pressure on you, or did that have any effect on you as far as being in the house of Yahweh? Um,. It didn't really put any pressure on me, you know, externally. It was more from my father um, than it was really anybody else. He was very, you know, he was more difficult on me. Um, My father was a very vain man, and uh, he, uh, anything I did was a direct reflection of him. So, um, yeah, he was always very difficult on me from a very early age, and whether it was... um, sports you know baseball martial arts it didn't matter i you know i had to be the best and uh Mm. that's the way i was raised and uh you know i don't really begrudge him for that now that's you know it just made me a stronger person i think but um does that answer your question (laughs) yeah no that does answer my question and it's actually very similar gary to a lot of other people who had um parents that were elders they've we've we've heard very similar responses that that what it did put pressure on them because the parents felt that their kids had to behave and act a certain way and therefore put that pressure on their children because they knew that their children's behavior was a direct reflection on them as far as the house of Yahweh hierarchy went. And then I was, um, I think I was 13 when I was, when they ordained a deacon. I was at the time I was the youngest at the time. Um, wow. Yeah. So after yeah. It, it, the pressure got even better and it was stronger because the, after I was a deacon, then my dad wanted me to be an elder, the youngest elder. And it was just, mm. 
a little bit of pressure. Yeah, that's a lot of pressure, actually. <laughs> wow. So here you were at. Uh oh, we lost your your volume, Autumn. Are you still there? Do this to me. Can there we you go. Me? I hear you now. We can hear you now. Go ahead. Right when I have an important question. I know. <laughs> Um, so what I was saying was, wow, so not only were 13 the youngest deacon, and I actually remember that. That was a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, then you were also um, a runner, which I remember who the runners were, and that was slightly a big deal, too, because they were handpicked. I know that for a fact. I don't have to ask that. Right. Um, I, I, no, I was tough shit. No. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so were you able to, once you left the feast setting and actually went home, were you able to lead somewhat of a, a normal teenage existence or did it carry on? Um, as I grew up, you know, when I, when I was young, you know, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, um, I was, it was, it was hard. Um, because I would, I don't want to say I lived a double life, but I was, you know, I had to, I went to public school. Thankfully, my mom was an educator and education was important to them. So um, they made me go to school. And I know a lot of the other, um, you know, kids my age at that time didn't have that. You know, they were, they were made to work or, um, you know, they were told education isn't important because there's not going to be any future. So what's the point in getting an education? And they, still to this day preach that as far as I know um mm -hmm. which is crazy that was 30 years ago <laughs> right uh, just uh but so I did go to public school and uh like I when I was younger I my parents would send in notes to the teacher like I wasn't allowed to, back then we, we had to every morning we do the pledge of allegiance and mm. stand for the national anthem and stuff and I was never allowed to do that I had to sit down and that just always like brought attention to me and I never liked that. And as I got older, I just quit and I started standing with everyone else. And I just didn't want to uh, draw attention to myself like that. And, uh, especially, you know, once I got into high school and, right. um, yeah, as I got older, you know, once I was 15, 16, um, I don't know if the indoctrination just didn't completely stick with me or what, but I, kind of started questioning things pretty early um so i kind of had my you know i would live my life as i just tried to live it at home and then when i'd go to the feasts i would put on the feast face for people and um and so just to clarify for anybody who doesn't know gary you never actually lived down in texas on the grounds or near the grounds no. you were always an out-of-towner yes correct? i grew up in okay south carolina yeah so yeah, I never, I only, we only went, you know, for the three times a year we went to the feasts and um, then usually a couple times a year we would go out there just, you know, to visit. Um, as I got older, it was less about like the doctrines and the teachings and just more about the relationships I had. Um, right. I grew up with you guys, you know, you were my family, my friends, and I feel that. really all I knew. So um, that was, that was really my the most difficult thing with me, the, just the relation that I had. I feel that. that. Yes, definitely. I feel that. Um, this is a difficult question. Mm -hmm. Um, your father was in a multiple marriage. What yes. effect did this have on your relationship with him? Um, it had a, a fairly significant um impact on my relationship with him it uh he and I were never very close you know to begin with he was very overbearing and uh it just um he did what you know he it, it, I don't I'm not blaming him for anything it wasn't his you know he wasn't he didn't abuse me or anything like that he was just he was difficult on me and it put strain on our relationship and um and then once he moved this 15 year old girl into our house with us First of all, when when he first moved her in, I thought they were moving her in for me. Like, I, I thought they were, like, arranging a marriage with me. And 
Well, that's a legitimate um, thought. How old were you at that time, Gary? I was 15 or 16. I was a year older. She was a year younger than me. Wow. Um, his youngest child. Yeah. So. Yeah, that would that would be kind of confusing. On things, um, and then she lived with us for a couple of ye- uh, for a couple of years um, in our house, and then he ended up getting you know she got her own place, and uh, once she was old enough to get her own place, she got her own place. <laughs> And then uh, I didn't really see him a whole lot after that. He kind of was over there most of the time. And by that point, my sisters um, had both gone. Like, my oldest sister, she's so much older than me. She was more of a mother figure to me anyways. And, um, you know, she was married, left, had her own kids. And um, then my other sister, Christy, she had already moved out to Texas by then. And uh, so I was really the only one left in the house. And... It was just me and my mom, really, because it was, you know, he was always with her, so. Um. So, essentially, like, I think what we've heard in most cases with, with a multiple marriage is that they they try to make it sound like, like it can be all cohesive. But in most cases, it seems that once the man takes on a second wife, he tends to kind of desert his original family to some degree. Would you agree with that statement? Absolutely, yeah. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Oh, Boy. you do it, honey. You, you, uh, this brings up questions. That's what happens. <laughs> you, you just, you just threw a loop for me, Gary. So let me just verify this. She was 15 when your father looked at your mother and said, "I'm moving her into our house." Yeah. I don't know exactly. I, I'm, I'm kind of guesstimating the age there. Um, I was in well, high school. I was 15. Yeah. So okay. she's a year younger than me. So. Okay. So do you know how the conversation went? I'm moving her in with us because she needs a place to live or. Or was it made known she... right away? Was she going to be a wife? Um, it didn't take long for me to figure out that daddy had his eye on her. Um, mm. I was. I'm not a fool. So do you it, think? Uh, do you think your mom knew before she moved in the reason she was moving in? Do you assume that I, now? I, so, um, I would think that would be the. I mean, the whole reason Aga was, you know, she was a. Um, the, the girl had, a, she came from a single mother household, and her mom was kind of flighty and was never really around and. So we were taking her in to get her off the streets and just give her a good home. And, you know, that was the original story that, that was told. Um, but okay, I know they're always intent there for daddy to get him a young thing. Okay. Um, so, wow. um, Gary, having two sisters and a mom, and especially, especially now knowing this part of your story, um, did you, did you feel a sense of, of loyalty or feel a sense of responsibility of trying to protect your mom in that situation? I mean, how was your mom handling this? How did that affect her? Oh, it affected her drastically. Uh, she was, um, she was a mess for, for quite a while. I mean, she did the same as you did Autumn and I'm sure every other woman that was in that situation did and put on the face that, you know, I'm, you know, this is okay. You know, it's, the doctrine so i can't you know i'm totally for this but you know in the back of your mind you're like i hate that bitch and uh <laughs> it's just human nature you know you can't yeah uh, but yep. i've always been close with my sisters and my mom i uh i you know i never had any brothers there i had two older sisters and then my my mother and you know them they're three very strong women and um they are that's um, yes, I've always felt a loyalty to them over my dad. Um, oh, I love you for that, Gary. <laughs> That's awesome. <clears throat> I'm sorry, because um, I remember bits and pieces of this story, but at the time I was, um, you know, struggling with my own things, and I was trying to get, find a way to get out. But I remember, I think it was my very last feast, it was Tabernacles, um, and I remember talking to your mom. And first of all, your mom and Carrie and Mel's mom were like my other mom. 
Right. You know. Um, and I remember I didn't, I had heard the rumors, but I didn't think they were true because she was just so the same person, you know, um, caring, how are you doing? The babies are beautiful. Um, you know, and as I'm sitting here and I'm learning what, and, and, and to me, it's just, it's, it still amazes me 21 years later after leaving that there was so much more to the story than what people knew. Um, I mean, I can say my story for me was horrific, but I can't imagine having to move my husband's brand new what um and you you were you were always very close and exceptional of your mom and your sisters uh and you're right you you come from a family of three very strong we've got this women and um I don't know. I'm just, my heart's breaking right now. I was not anticipating it to break over these questions. So, <laughs> No, it, um, and, and I get where you're coming from because this is the thing is that we all think we know bits and pieces of the story, but we don't know the details until we talk to somebody that was there. And obviously your mom had that ability to, um, I'm going to crack a little bit too now, <laughs> to put on that face during the feast that I'm okay, everything's okay. But you probably were seeing her vulnerable and breaking emotionally in between at home when nobody was watching and that right. had to be okay. hard yeah okay all right sorry way to go here way to go okay um did the oh, wow did the situation on your family alter or change the way you personally thought about multiple marriage um, I don't say it ever really changed my opinion because I never had a high opinion of it. Um, I'm, I don't know. It's, I'm a very loyal person just naturally, I guess. And, um, the, the, just the thought of loving two women isn't, I, I can't comprehend that. Um, so it, it's never really, it was never really even, you know, it, it, I was never okay with it. it and it all came out about the same time as like the, the slavery and, you know, when everybody started changing their names and, um, you know, all that crap just came out all at once. And, um, yeah, I never really, I don't know if I just never wrapped my mind around it or if it just never really clicked with me. Um, and of course I saw what it did to my mother. So it, right. you know, Absolutely. obviously tainted my opinion of it um so yeah. having said that Gary that kind just, of I just gotta tell you I'm sorry Mel Gary oh, that's I, just okay. I just want to wrap my arms around you right now not only as a mother but you know as you're you're at one point second big sister because I'm just you were always just such a wonderful kid and to know that as a kid you had these thoughts I'm just losing it today. Oh my gosh. Gary, I'm so proud of you. But go ahead, Mel. Go ahead. No, no, you're right because it's you were in a situation where it's not always easy to be an independent thinker, Gary, but you were able to um see that situation in your own way and come to your own conclusion without being influenced by the teachings or the doctrine and come to your own conclusion at your inner core of what you thought was right and wrong. And that is not an easy thing to do. That tells me uh, a lot about your character and a lot about your personality and a lot about who you are. It speaks volumes. And, and to make it even more so that people will understand why we're saying this to you. You were the son of an elder that had quite a lot of bit of influence. You could have handpicked, cherry-picked, whatever you want to call your life. Your life could have been with multiples or 
Um, I'm the head. You must listen to me. I mean, you could have. I don't know if this is true because I know your mom and I don't want to say her name, but I don't think you could have ran her house. But you could have taken and run with this. And you know what I think? You, I'm going to interject here a little bit. This is what I think. I think Gary was raised by his mom and his sisters, and he, they had a very strong influence on him. And it also speaks volumes about who your mom and your sisters are. And they are great, great women. And I think they they probably raised you to be the man that you are. And Gary, you're, you're just... <laughs> Gary, you're whatever. We love you, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> so... So this does lead to our next question, which is what what ultimately led you uh, to leave? When and why did you ultimately leave the house of Yahweh? Um, like I said, it kind of started once I got to high school um, and I kind of I wasn't in, you know, I, being that I wasn't out of town or I didn't have the constant eyes on me. Um, so I could kind of lead my own life and my parents were bless their heart they were very naive um which is easy to tell why they got sucked into all this um so i got a lot of i got away with quite a lot when i was younger <laughs> but um yeah i would i still had kind of one foot in one foot out there those last few years yep uh, you know i had my life in the world that i wanted and then but i had my friends and my you know the people that i loved were there and that was why the only reason that I stayed as long as I did. Um, but ultimately, you know, they came, there was the, I don't know, you know, the order of events in which they started take, bringing all this stuff out, but it was, you know, the multiple marriages and the slavery and then the, uh, and just that in itself really turned me off. Um, just being, growing up in the South, that word just brings a lot to the surface. Um, no matter what color you are and especially when my best friend was black and uh it it just and that never sat well with me the whole alling ceremony where we had to pledge our undying allegiance to Yisro Hawkins for ever and ever and literally claim to be his slaves uh, that never sat well with me and then the multiple marriage stuff and then Satan's a woman and um I think my final straw was the confessions. Um, mm. Tabernacles at 88 or 89, I think it was eight, or, uh, 99, was my last feast. And that was the feast that we were all supposed to, we had to do our confessions in. Um, I was supposed to have done it like very first, you know, one of the first days of the feast, I, I was scheduled to do it. And I kept pushing it back, kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. So finally, um, the feast was over and I hadn't done it yet. So my parents um, ended up going back separately and I, I went, I drove home myself. So I stayed for an extra day and I, I went that morning to do my confessions and I sat down in that room with those elders and I kind of started and I just basically, I couldn't do it. Um, I just got up and walked out and never came back. Wow. Um, and how old just, were you at that time, Gary? Um, I think I was 19, 99. Uh, Tabernacles of 99, I think, was my last. Okay. Uh, so I was 19, so. Wow. Plenty old enough to make. Um, yeah. You just decided. But, yeah, I don't think you guys need to know everything about me. <laughs> I think this, yeah. is, uh, this is drawing a line here. I'm drawing a real clear right. line. I'm not going to cross it. <laughs> and to me, that just seemed like just i mean indoctrination 101 i mean you you get right. them everyone to tell you their deepest darkest secrets and then you hold it against them and you know blackmail them with it i mean that's cult 101 <coughs> so, <laughs> so i you. just well, give that power over me basically right. that was my very last feast too and i did not go to confession and what some people may not know that you know gary <coughs> is they wanted you to confess from day one of your life right all the way to that very moment of right. your life and 
They wanted to know the juicy details. <laughs> you know? Yes. And they were asking questions to elaborate and mm. to add to. And they were all recorded, I'm sure. Yes. They were all recorded and written down. Mm -hmm. Oh, they were. Um, so they were. They yes. were recording these. Oh, so they were wanting to use oh. these as as future ways to. Well, I don't potentially... know if they're recorded now, or if the weekly ones were recorded. But I know the very first ones were. Right. Yeah, that's disturbing in itself. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how how would you not so, think that was going to be potentially used against you, or used to manipulate you, or control you in some way? Or yeah, that's. That's creepy. <laughs> so imagine being a 19-year-old pubescent boy, pre-pubescent pubescent boy. Yeah. Yeah. And then no. saying you have to confess on my, you know what, Gary, you're better than me because I told him you don't want me to go into confessions because I would have come up with wild stories. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I would have been like, and your wife, and your wife, and your second wife, and Okay, let me stop and record. <laughs> Gary, Gary, was it a hard decision when you decided not to come back? Um, yes and no. It was, you know, on one hand, it was the easiest decision I ever made in my life. And on the other hand, um, just because of the relationships I had, that was the only thing that, that really pulled at me. Um, and honestly, that was the only reason that I stayed as long as I did was because of my friends, you know, because of y'all and the relationships that I had with everyone. And, um, and still to this day, quite a few, you know, everybody that's that's left, we still keep in contact. And I still, you know, you're still my family. You always will be. Um, I feel the same way. Me yep. too. Yep. I still think of Gary as a little fact, brother. Gary used to live in LaGrange, which is, I think, like 45 minutes from me. And we tried so hard to get together, and we just couldn't. But I would get so excited to know I would get to see him again. <laughs> yep, with Brandon um, once, um, where I was working at the time, they did these big, like, Christmas lights. And uh, Brandon and uh, his family lived. I think they lived in, yeah. And, uh so they came up and I actually, I was supposed to go with them to go see the lights and stuff, but my son had the flu or something, so I couldn't go, mm. but I just met them at the gas station and gave them their tickets and kind of chit chatted with them for a few minutes. And, um, that was, so I did get to see him briefly. Um, that was, so was that the Callaway garden? Is that when you were working at Callaway? Mm -hmm. Now that's a job to have. Go ahead now. <laughs> Oh no! Well, we're actually down to about four minutes, and I have another question. And we're but I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and stop. We're gonna have a part two with Gary, so stay with us, stay tuned. Everybody, come back for part two of the rest of Gary's story. You don't want to miss it. We'll be right back. And get fresh Kleenex. Yeah. 